Hi everyone, your Chess Puzzler here and welcome to the channel. Today we have the last round of the Blitz of this specific tournament. It has been like no other when it comes to excitement, drama, time pressure and of course an added factor that only takes place in online games is those terrible ass slips. How many times did we get to see them? And how many games were lost? Why are all these mouse slips so serious? I will bring out a game that you don't get to see every day. It's not from this tournament. I recommend you watch it. It's a little girl who was up against a very famous chair. When you come along, the title which involves a queen this will be it. The queen here is not the piece, but the very person who plays. This will be the next game to feature, and I highly recommend anyone who's an amateur to just watch this game. I would add a link, but the game is not ready yet. Today's game is a really difficult choice. What on earth do you cover? Let me run you through the standings to see who's there. Magnus leads with 18 and a half points and Wesley is in his footsteps with half a point less. The standings should be shown by now, but they're not. Okay, <laughs> here we have him. So uh, you can check him out yourself. Can Napo, Hikaru and Sasha close in? There is a total of nine points up for grabs today. And imagine anyone who's able to accomplish this. And this person is neither Magnus nor Wesley. This table here only considers the Blitz games of day one. Those games played earlier today have not been added to this list. We know this course, this column is empty. Before I get on with today's game, just a quick word on another competition, if I may. It's this tournament regarding the best engines of season 19. I can't believe how unpopular it is. People are just not watching them. Does anyone know what is happening here? The Premier League is ending very soon. 170 games are out of the way from a total of 224 and this is what we have. It's small, but I hope you're able to read it and check out the point difference across the standings. So the prediction is that the top two engines will meet again in this season for that very marathonial 100 game match. The gap at the top is too large to breach, so both Stockfish and LC zero are definitely meeting again. Coming back to this online tournament, this is a game I would like to cover. Given what we have seen yesterday, <laughs> I'm taking a very big risk. So, it's to get me to these two again. And the details you need are now showing. You know what, because <laughs> Many are already talking about the game of round 10 between Naka and Magnus. Let me do something that I don't often do. And just let me run you through the last few moves of this game. So ignore the details on the side and check this out. This is move 7c and after bishop takes c4. Magnus went for the unthinkable here. He must have woken up on the wrong side of his bed. He retreated the knight, and this move is punishable. Naka took, and with Magnus being forced to capture, not only he opens up a very critical file, but given Naka is the opposition, who is this time far more time than Magnus has. He chose for king h1, just not to allow an intermediate chance. With Magnus doing the same, Naka lifted the rook here, and Magnus just does the unthinkable again. 
he sacked his bishop through this move. The idea is clear. With Naka getting rid of the bishop, Magnus came up with this answer. He's going to get something in return. I don't think Naka really minded. With this queen repositioning, if this bishop comes off after rook h3, north can't stop the mate. So when queen h4 materialized on the board, Magnus went again for the unthinkable. Having gone for this knight to g8, rook h3 is still game over. There is very likely this response. But after rook g3, however Magnus plays it, and if you take this bishop, it's all about this queen move. With this position being reached, the mate on g7 can't be stopped. But after knight g8, Naka still misses his mate. This is what he did. Magnus still went on to get rid of this bishop and actually gives the opportunity to Naka to finish him off. In this point in time, Magnus avoids humiliation and in a way he chose to resign. The alternative would have been a mate in two, and what a way to start the final day in this tournament. So consider this to be the bonus material, if you like, before we get off with our next game. Other things also happened, but let's stick to this game in particular. Magnus has south of the board and chooses to go for a queen's type of game. Knight of six, c4. Six and now knight of three, and with Wesley going for this response, we also transpose into the queen's gambit. Knight c3 and bishop e7 led to the only move Magnus would really go for. This bishop to f4 is the infamous Harwich attack. With Wesley going for short, Magnus locks out this bishop to the king's side because he's opening well we covered so many times before i'm going to skip you can always chase after this bishop on f4 at some stage this bishop can't be saved is not the question the question to answer is whether any side will be better off whether you take or not wesley spend no time on his follow-up response. He introduced this knight into the game. Magnus opted for this avenue of play. And with Wesley trading here, if you capture this pawn, you would, in a way, lose a tempo. It's not that bad, though. It's the normal thing to do. But Magnus, however, played this differently. He first castled. And there is no rush to try and regain the pawn course. This guy on c4 can't be saved. What did Wesley do here? He introduced this response. This guy came off. And with Wesley capturing with the knight, this guy on c4 eventually comes off. In no time, the queens also went. This position, you see, has been seen before knots in one but hundreds of games. So this is the fastest version of a classical and in a way fast forward. It's all about the ability to recall, which also means something Fisher used to say. Also Fisher said he hated the game so much, only for this reason. I hope you know what he said. It was a game that needed memory and plenty of it. Wesley went for this pawn push. Not so much to cover his otherwise protected knight, but b6 gets his bishop on c8 ready to shoot. So Magnus here jumped the knight into this outpost, and with Wesley getting his bishop into the diagonal, Magnus's move was instant. This is what he did. If you go back to the start, we talked about a possible attack on the bishop. Well, I guess this will be the right time to see what happens if the bishop comes under fire. Because it was just about here when Wesley went chasing after him. 
and the idea is how Magnus played it. He bypassed his threats on the bishop and initiated his own attack on the queen's side. He too chased after the knight. If you choose to remove the bishop, if you also capture, what happens if North hunts after this knight? If you eliminate this knight first, you would have blown it big time in a way. Because this guy comes off with a check after King H1. When this knight goes home too, this variation continues with yet another takes check. King to the corner is forced and probably F5 or even takes and both sides should be okay unless I'm wrong. There are so many other variations you can go for. After this knight gets attacked on e5, if Sam reciprocates the attack, and with the time to get rid of this knight, south would, well, it would be much stronger. Well, this knight can come off. The other in between move will be to get rid of this guy with a check and then go for the knight. So king h8 and rook takes, and you would think one of these two bishops is history. It's not as easy as it looks. Go for this pawn on b4. This position will require plenty of thinking. Let's see how Magnus and Wesley played it. When this knight got attacked, Wesley backed him off. And with Magnus deciding to go for this type of cover, Wesley applied this pin. It's an interesting one because it somehow paralyzes his knight in e5. Magnus can always go for rook c1 to free up this knight on e5. So what he did, however, was to slow down considerably. He began to think, think, and think again, burning 2 minutes and 55 seconds for a single move in a 5 minute game. It's not unheard of, but pretty rare. If everyone is known to do, well, something like this, he will be the world champion himself, all right. Magnus first got rid of the knight for the bishop. And the only reason for this was to be able to free up the light squares on the diagonal. So what he did here was to lift the knight into the center of the board just to be able to chase after this bishop. I don't think Wesley worried too much cause he has two ways of protecting this bishop. Wesley also spent nearly one and a half minutes to try and find a good answer to this challenge. He first got rid of the rook and with Wesley capturing in this way, which had to be the logical way forward, this is how Magnus responds. Now, if you went for this avenue of play, you're not looking at what seems to be the obvious and pin the knight, but this is what you're looking for. Rook c8 never works, so let's not even consider it. If you want to save the pawn after rook a8, what does this move do? Is this rook really locked in? Nope, there is always this attack on the knight. And all you make here is a big hole in the water. After this rook move to c1, this is how Wesley played it. And he's really looking to bring his bishop into the game. Magnus is not a person who's going to sit back and just wait. He charged after the knight, forcing off these two minor pieces. And with Wesley trying to take advantage of this position, this is what he does. King up the board, got Wesley in with this attack, and with the knight having only a single square to land on, which is considered to be a safe square, when Magnus went for this particular move, if you don't fancy removing the knight, you definitely need to protect this pawn on e6. But there is something else to consider. With this bishop locked in, in a way, Wes got rid of this guy. This guy was also removed, and Wesley goes for it. He didn't even calculate this move. After this check, the king chased after the bishop, and with two more minor pieces coming off, does this look like a draw? 
King F8, got Magnus in with this attack. And with one of these two guys looking to come off, Wesley has Rook B2, Rook E5. The third option is to go for what Wesley did. He attacked this knight in a way. If you come in with this check after takes and takes, go for A5, and the game can, I'm not going to say can, may easily draw. And this is even after Rook D6. For starters, there is this check. Many pawns will start to disappear one by one. Let's come back to see what really happened. When this knight was attacked, any idea what Magnus chose to do? Are there any daring takers? Well, check this out. This is a top-notch response. If the knight is eliminated, can you see the ending? It's not takes cause this game goes nowhere. Rather than start to grab pawns, why not try this nifty check? When this king is flushed forwards, now we can remove this pawn. Now, this will be game over. So let's see what happened right after g6. Wesley blunders with this response. It's a very strong rook check on f7, but miraculously, this one is missed too. Magnus went for this check we looked at earlier. You know what, guys? If take was too obvious, Wesley appears to blunder again. He picks up his king and places him right in the path of trouble. Right now, this is Magnus's nickname. Magnus could have gone for this pawn on h5, but doesn't. He really doesn't care too much at this stage. He knows he can win this endgame, so he removed this pawn with an auto check. And in a way, he too blunders himself, like you do in these types of games. It's not who doesn't blunder, but who can take most of the advantage when a blunder takes place. After king f6, another pawn bit the dust, and with Wesley coming in with this check, when Magnus pushed to the fourth, Wesley takes here. Magnus recaptures. It's all about who runs faster and who is able to grab as many points as possible. With this guy coming off, Magnus chased after the bishop. When this check appeared, Magnus backs off his king. And with Wesley going for this pawn, what a mess. With takes and takes, Wesley got himself into a very difficult end game. Look at the situation here. He's down by knight. So, let's see what happened. Knight back to safety. A check appeared. The king backs off again, and when Wesley attacked the knight, Magnus checks the king. King f6 led to this response. Wesley went for yet another king move, and in a way, he's taking enormous risks. Knight back with another discovered check. This knight was pursued. Magnus now comes in with this check, and with the king backing off, Magnus now goes after this pawn. King back to cover, and this is now a matter of who eats up his own time. It's close though. Rook a6, rook c4, king up the board, and rook b4, and Magnus goes for it. He launched this guy. Rook b3 got Magnus to bring his king forward. Another check followed. With the king backing off, if Magnus wants to win, he will need to find another route. Rook b3, duh. Got Magnus now in with this rook move. And this time this king will climb. e5. This move. And this is how West plays it. 
Knight up the board, rook c6, and h5. And we have another turn moves before it all ends. Rook b6, knight back to e4, which is key. It stops the rook's access to this square to e4. When Magnus gets his own rook to move. With Wesley going for this king move, Magnus chases after this pawn. What is wrong with rook b4? Nothing, but Wesley and Magnus are both playing with only seconds left. Wesley attacked the knight. The horse climbed here, and with this pawn advancing to the fourth, it was time for this guy to rest in peace. e3 got this rook to shatter any dreams this pawn has of ever making it, but with Wesley protecting this pawn, Okay, it's not the best game to look at, but at least it's 100 times better than the previous encounter. Magnus came in with this check. The king advanced here. Magnus blocks or attacks in a way, if you like. So whatever it takes to stop this dangerous pawn. After Wesley got the king to come closer to his pawn, we know Magnus blunders. And if you want to see him blunder, Again, check this out. This is what he played. There is another way to do it, which is way simpler. If you go on and grab this pawn, eliminate the rock, and this is how you speed things up. These are the cases where knights shine. King f3 is a blunder, but the ending is not bound to change. Rook b3 trying to hold on to this pawn, Got this check in, and with Wesley very desperate in a way to protect his pawn and only chance to win, this is what he does. When Magnus delivered this check, it's not only a simple check, but a mating two. Obviously, at this point in time, Wesley resigned. King f1 is forced, and this is how you mate, and let's hear it. It's the blow Wesley could not afford to suffer. At the time of analysing this game, we are in round 16 and Magnus still holds the lead ahead of Wesley with only half a point difference. With two more rounds to go, everything is still possible and up for grabs. Of course, having said this, the only person who can really threaten Magnus is Wesley himself. It's all in those two last rounds. More to come, so until soon everyone. You know what's coming. Your chess puzzle are here. And whatever you do, safety always first. <laughs>